All right, so it's 8.03. Uh, the number seems to be stabilizing, so I'm going to uh, start proceedings. Good morning, all, and good afternoon to Professor Josko, who's joining us from the East Coast of the US. My name is Guillaume Roger. I'm an Associate Professor of Economics at Monash University, and I'm hosting this morning's session. So this morning session is the first of two webinars, which are co-sponsored by the Energy Security Board um, AIMO and Monash. Um, the intent of this session is to inform policymakers and market participants alike in the face of reforms which are necessary to accommodate the realities of the modern grid. And I hasten to add that they, that they are not a preview of what those reforms may be. This work still remains to be done, but they're meant to be informative. Depending on the feedback, we're going to run more such sessions in 2021, either on new topics or to further explore the topics that we'll add in 2020. Uh, on proceedings, we have a large number of uh, participants and attendees on the computer, so asking questions will be challenging this morning. Uh, I hope we all know that after six months of using Zoom. Um, our speaker will take no more than 45 minutes to allow for some questions at the end, and so unless a clarification is urgently required, I would like to ask you to wait until the Q&A session. You can use the Q&A function to ask your questions. We may curate some of the questions, you know, to group them into coherent uh, set. We may be unable to treat all questions. In this case, feel free to email uh, me or to email Shahab, from whom you got the uh, invitation email, or relay your questions in some other way. Uh, I'm going to turn over to Simon Wilkie. Simon is the Dean of the Monash Business School and is going to uh, introduce our speaker today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Guillaume. So uh, welcome everybody to the first of this series of uh, webinars, uh, which are joint with, uh, as Guillaume mentioned, uh, jointly sponsored by Monash Business School, the Monash Energy Institute, the uh, AEMO, uh, and in the Energy Security Board. Um, we have a big challenge in front of us, which is how do we design markets for the future, uh, given the changes in the electricity grid? So the topic for today's talk is post-2025 market design, the economics of modern electricity grids. And we're very excited to have Professor Paul Joskow here with us today. Uh, Paul is the Elizabeth and James Killen Professor of Economics Emeritus at MIT. He's a distinguished fellow of the American Economics Association, fellow of the Econometric Society, and fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, from 2008 to 2017, he was president of the Alfred Sloan Foundation, uh, and he's also served as head of, um, perhaps his most challenging position was being head of the economics department at MIT, I'm sure. Uh, Paul's known for his long 50-year career in economics and is the, arguably the leading economist on uh, the economics of energy markets. So, Paul. Uh, thank you. I'm going to... Uh... I'll share my screen because I have a presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the uh, sun is setting here in Boston at the moment. Uh, and thank you for inviting me. Can we see that? Yes. Yes, Paul. OK, good. OK, I'm going to, there, there are a whole lot of topics that uh, I can discuss. Uh, uh, I'm going to focus today on resource adequacy issues and storage and uh, high, high variable renewable energy penetration systems, intermittent systems. Those are systems with very high penetrations of wind and solar uh, and, uh, and uh, increasingly uh, uh, storage. Uh, I would like to make just one general observation. Uh, since I've been involved in electricity regulation and restructuring for a very long time, actually since I was a PhD student, uh, the, the context in many countries is, is changing. Uh, uh, if we, we look back at the 1990s and uh, the first 10 years of the 2000s, uh, uh, the you know, focus in many countries was on creating competitive markets, uh, market integration between regions, uh, a lot of focus on short-term markets, day ahead and uh, real-time markets. Uh, the, the design of these markets uh, was built around uh, uh, systems with uh, dispatchable generation, fossil generation, uh, and some nuclear generation, really building on models uh, 
uh, economic models or economic engineering models from the uh, uh, 1950s, uh, going back to Electricité de France, uh, and also worked by Fred Schweppe at MIT in the 1970s on, on transmission congestion. Uh, consumers were always viewed as being passive, demand was uh, inelastic, uh, and uh, the, the focus was on using the existing uh, transmission infrastructure uh, uh, as efficiently as possible. And, and the context is now changing primarily because of the uh, increasing focus on, uh, on decarbonization, uh, whether occurring naturally as a result of uh, the tremendous uh, uh, reductions in the costs of wind and solar or as a result of, uh, of policies that are being implemented. Uh, so, for example, in the U.S., while the U.S., uh, at least uh, up until January 20th, uh, has no real national policy, many of the states have policies. Uh, so in the Northeast, uh, from, from Maine to, uh, to Virginia, uh, all of the states have uh, adopted goals of uh, 100% carbon-free, uh, carbon-free electricity sectors by by roughly 2050. Uh, the one exception is New Hampshire, uh, California, Illinois, and other states have adopted similar policies. And and people are thinking through how how introducing large volumes of uh, of dispatchable gen of non-dispatchable generation uh, will affect uh, how markets operate and and, and market design. Uh, the nature of the technologies is very different. They're, these are wind and solar are technologies that are very capital intensive. Uh, the marginal costs of operation are, are, are zero or very, very close to zero. Uh, this has implications for investment incentives uh, uh, and also for the kinds of signals that are sent to, to, to consumers. And of course, consumers are now becoming more active. They, they have rooftop PV, they have storage, uh, they have smart meters uh, and technologies that can allow them, at least in principle, to adapt to uh, to uh, pricing changes uh, in the uh, and variations in the wholesale market. And there's a renewed focus uh, on on transmission investment uh, and upgrades to the distribution system to accommodate all of these changes. Uh, there have been a number of studies in the U.S. that show that uh, achieving good uh, Deep decarbonization goals would be much, much more economical, much less costly uh, if we had a, a more robust uh, interregional transmission system. So let me turn to resource adequacy. Uh, uh, this term is, is generally used in the US to reflect uh, the generating resources necessary to balance supply and demand with a very low probability that a generation supply deficiency will lead to involuntary curtailments of. Uh, of load. In other words, keep the lights on with very high probability. Uh, it reflects system reliability criteria that, that vary somewhat from system to system. And in the US, the standard is one loss of firm load every 10 years, uh, which is uh, almost never. Uh, and this is translated into some kind of a planning or forecast reserve margin in many places. Uh, and this involves uh, of making forecasts of uh, uh, future demand growth uh, over periods from two or three to 10 years, uh, uh, calculating uh, uh, generation and demand response required to meet peak demand, to meet the reliability criteria, and evaluating future generation needed to meet capacity and demand response targets. Uh, some variant of this process is used everywhere in the US, except at least directly uh, in ERCOT, and I'll talk a little bit more of that. Uh, in Europe, uh, these issues are also very live. They, they have a different phrase. They're called security of supply. Uh, and uh, the, these interests have been triggered because of the, the deep decarbonization goals that have been established uh, uh, in, uh, certainly in Europe and, and in, in many parts of the US. And, and I view the challenge as to how do we harmonize the reliability, keeping the lights on uh, with decarbonization goals in, a, in an efficient way. Uh, if you look around the world, there's actually quite a lot of diversity in how electricity markets uh, uh, and regulation have been, uh, uh, have, have, have been redesigned sometimes multiple times. Uh, uh, England is on its third iteration of, its, uh, of competitive electricity markets. Uh, but one of the key issues is 
who has responsibility for uh, making sure that there are adequate resources to, uh, to, to meet uh, system reliability criteria. And it, it varies fairly widely from, uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, um, many places, the load serving entities, whether they're more traditional bundled utilities or unbundled uh, uh, retail choice areas, uh, have resource adequacy responsibility, which they meet through ownership of generating capacity uh, and or often long-term PPAs. Uh, California uh, and most areas without retail choice place these ob obligations on, uh, on utilities, uh, the distribution utilities, uh, and they meet them with a variation in, in a mix of long-term contracts, a little bit of ownership of hydro facilities in particular. Uh, then there are areas uh, like New England and New York and PJM uh, uh, and the California ISO, the wholesale market, uh, where, where they forecast capacity needs for the entire ISO area to meet the resource adequacy requirement that's uh, defined given their, uh, their analysis of peak demand and supply forecasts and the associated uncertainties. And uh, they, they come up with, a, with a, a, a set of estimates of how much capacity and voluntary demand response is needed uh, and set up a market to uh, have generators and demand response bid, bid in to supply the needed, the needed capacity. And that's called the capacity market. Uh, ISO New England has one, the New York ISO has one, uh, PJM has one, uh, the Midwest ISO has one, uh, and England and Wales now has one. Uh, then there are energy only markets. I put it in quotations because I wanna refer first to the market in, in, in ERCOP, which covers most of Texas. Uh, it's an energy only market. There's no defined ca capacity responsibility, no capacity market, but there is scarcity pricing during certain stress conditions reflecting operating reserve contingencies using, using a, an administrative operating reserve demand curve with a price cap reflecting the value of lost load, which is now uh, $9,000 a megawatt hour. It also reflects analyses uh, of loss of load probabilities under different contingency, the duration of loads and so on. And then there are a number of places, real energy only markets without a administrative operating reserve demand curve where uh, there are very high price caps, uh, where uh, there, there is no, no one has resource, resource adequacy responsibility in the sense that we see it in uh, in, uh, in many other countries. And uh, uh, Australia is an example of that. And I think your price cap is now about $15,000 in Australian dollars. Uh, Alberta uh, has a real energy only market. And they, they recently went through an extensive evaluation of whether they should introduce a capacity market because of concerns about reliability. And they concluded it wasn't necessary and continued with the market that they, uh, that they had. Uh, uh, regardless of which approach to assigning responsibility, the analytical issues have traditionally been fairly similar. Uh, they, again, they're developed for systems with primarily dispatchable fossil and nuclear generating capacity, basically static generation dispatch curves over, a, over short periods of time, variable demand, and inelastic demand. And they forecast the peak demand for up to 10 years. They choose a reliability criterion. Uh, loss of load probability. Uh, it may be annual, it may be seasonal, uh, it may be monthly, and they define reserve margins that they're, they're trying to hit uh, uh, and the capacity needed to, uh, to meet those. Uh, the, in, in states with the resource, where resource adequacy is placed on the load serving entities, this defines their generation demand response obligations and it's often reflected in some kind of an integrated resource plan, and it usually requires some combination of ownership and PB, PPAs by the by the uh, uh, by the uh, uh, load serving entities. And and this just doesn't just apply to traditional utilities that have uh, uh, default service obligations to their customers, uh, or to uh, or to traditional utilities where there, where retail retail competition has not emerged. Uh, in a number of places, in particular California, 
uh, competitive uh, suppliers uh, are assigned uh, uh, resource adequacy responsibilities and, and their LSEs in California, their community, co community choice aggregation entities that have come in and basically provide the equivalent of retail choice, but to, uh, to individual communities. Uh, in ISOs with centralized capacity markets, like here in New England, uh, this process defines a target demand for capacity and demand response. Uh, it's reflected as a, as a demand for capacity uh, in the capacity market. And in ERCOT, the, the ORDC is derived from first principles, the loss of load probability, the value of lost load. That's not a nerve that should be unserved energy targets, the duration of outages, uh, and other, uh, other basic metrics, rather than coming up with a crude, uh, a crude reserve margin. And just to uh, indicate how, I'm gonna turn on my, uh, my pointer here. What do we want? Let's get the laser pointer. Uh, this is just an example of kind of the, the old regime. We had a, 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 a disp bid based dispatch curve that uh, reflected the diversity of primarily uh, fossil generation. Down here might have been very efficient coal units. Uh, here, less efficient coal units. Here, CCGTs with gas. Here, uh, Open cycle, open cycle gas turbines, and here sort of all uh, inefficient uh, capacity, and uh, the markets basically work by uh, 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 marching up and down the dispatch curve to define price prices based on what was assumed to be inelastic demand, and the resource adequacy goal uh, is to is to figure out well what do you want to do when demand exceeds capacity, and this is capacity here. And uh, that's when you need to shed load uh, and uh, involuntarily shed, shed load. And the whole resource adequacy exercise that uh, is gone through in, in the old regime was to decide how big, how often you wanted this to occur and how big it, how big it could be. And in most places that, uh, that, that go through this exercise historically, the probability of lost load from a generation supply deficiency was, was, was typically very, very low. Uh, in the US, if you look at uh, reliability overall, 90% of it is due to failures on the distribution system, uh, sometimes due to uh, storms, but sometimes also due to uh, uh, fires or, or, or uh, uh, faults on the distribution system, and sometimes just due to cars running into, into poles uh, when they're overhead systems. Of the, of the other 10%, almost all of it is due to transmission line failures, al almost always due to serious storms, and almost none of it is due to, to deficiencies in generation. This is kind of, to me, kind of an anomaly that uh, for the typical customer uh, uh, that, that, that has to weather involuntary outages, very little of it is uh, due to uh, generating capacity or voluntary demand response, but we spend a whole lot of attention on that and very little on reliability at the, the distribution level, at least in, uh, in my experience. And here you can see this comes from uh, uh, ERCOT. Uh, this, this is some of the backup that goes into their uh, evaluation and calculation of the operating reserve uh, demand curve. And it, 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 it does, you, you can translate it into traditional metrics of uh, loss of load probabilities, hours of lost load, uh, uh, megawatt hours of lost energy, uh, the duration and so on. And uh, uh, in, in, in ERCOT, these are used to help to define where they wanna put uh, the operating reserve demand curve, which I will, I will display in a moment. Uh, but you can also go back and look at this. And so in California, uh, I just read one of their decisions. Uh, uh, the the loss of lo the uh, it's supposed to be 0 0.1 events per year. That's one day in 10 years, and that would yield, given the the uh, the data in, uh, in in Texas, if it were similar to California, you know, about a 15% reserve margin, which which turns out to be the way they plan their system is to uh, have a 15% reserve margin and uh, one loss of load and uh, in uh, in ten years, uh, here's a picture from New England. Basically, the uh, resource adequacy exercise defines for the entire region how much capacity is going to be needed over a period of three years into the future. 
Uh, that defines the bogey that, that establishes the market. They, they build a demand curve around that to basically, it's somewhat arbitrary, uh, but to basically reflect the uh, value in terms of reduced reduce probability of lost load of having more generating capacity than the target uh, and the increase in loss of load probability uh, of, of having less capacity. And the market can clear anywhere along this, uh, along this uh, uh, demand curve. Uh, and here's just an example. These auctions are run every year. They're three year forward auctions. The, the, the bidders that clear the market uh, are paid a market clearing price for capacity uh, for three years into the future. Uh, they're only paid if they deliver. So there's a, there's a performance commitment. They have to be there on days when the system is, is stressed and the system operator determines that, that uh, they have to be called. But as you can see, these are prices over a, a period of, uh, uh, of several auctions and, and they kind of vary all over the place, uh, uh, especially now as much more variable re renewable energy is coming into the market. Uh, the prices have declined. Also increased demand response has, uh, has led to prices declining to, to now the, the capacity value is almost nothing. And I'll come back to this, but this has led to the question in New England where uh, there still isn't uh, uh, all, the, all that much variable renewable energy on the, uh, on the system uh, is, is how that would fit into the capacity market. How much capacity credit do you give to a, a solar facility or to a, uh, to a wind generator? And, and I'll come back to that in a little while because uh, California has actually done quite a bit of analysis of this. Uh, this is the operating reserve demand curve in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in ERCOT, which is again, about 80% of Texas. And the way this works, unlike the, the capacity markets where you're basically getting a forward contract for making your capacity available to the ISO during uh, peak or stress conditions, uh, the operating reserve demand curve is a, is a spot market. It's a, it's a, 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 a day ahead in real time market phenomenon. So that if operating reserves decline below various target levels, as the loss of load probability uh, increases and the amount of energy that would be, uh, that would be lost decreases, prices rise uh, until they're capped at the value of lost load, which is, is now $9,000 US dollars a, a, a megawatt hour. Now, I'll just say the value of lost load is not some number given to us by God. Uh, it's, it's an estimate. If you look at the literature estimating the value of lost load, it's number one, it varies all over the map. Number two, it depends on what kind of customer you are as to uh, how much you value the, the cost of suddenly losing your electricity. Uh, and it's generally higher for certain kinds of industrial customers than for, for residential customers. And it, it, it depends importantly on the duration. So if, if you're gonna lose uh, electricity for an hour and they tell you that three hours in advance, that's a whole lot different from uh, losing electricity for, for a day and, and, and it happening, happening very suddenly. So th this is a construct I, I, in, a, in a talk I gave last week, uh, an ERCOT ORDC proponent made it clear that uh, this is an important part of their market that it, it is the it is what uh, they view as a market-based assurance uh, of uh, of resource adequacy in the system, and they've adapted it over time. Uh, so over time, they've they've raised they basically shifted up the uh, the ORDC so that it, it now it now hits the vertical axis at nine thousand dollars, and this is a result of analysis they do every year to see if it's. Uh, uh, given what they know about supply and demand conditions, uh, whether uh, whether they're going to uh, uh, have an unacceptable level of outages. So it kind of all comes back to the same thing in the uh, in the end. Okay, so let's now talk about deep penetration of variable renewable energy. Uh, I use that term because that's what everybody uses. I like to refer to it as intermittent uh, energy because it it uh, uh, reflects, uh, I think, more accurately the the, the issue we're dealing with. Uh, how do we how do we deal with the resource adequacy issues that is keeping the lights on uh, in a world where we have a whole lot of uh, uh, wind and solar 
uh, and very little dispatch, traditional dispatchable generation. So if you're really going to 100% carbon free, uh, you're not going to even have any gas in the system. Uh, maybe you'll have hydrogen, uh, maybe not. Uh, and uh, uh, as I'll come back to that, that's where storage comes in. So uh, the, the traditional approaches are basically reflect a static economic dispatch curve. It, given whatever the stock of capacity is, uh, you can define what the dispatch curve is for the summer and for the winter and so on. And you can you, you focus on demand moving up and down the dispatch curve and how high it will go in different periods of time uh, uh, to, to, to analyze what the probability of losing, losing load is. But with, with high penetration of uh, variable renewable energy, the, the short run supply curve uh, isn't static. It moves back and forth considerably with exogenous and uncertain variations in wind and solar output. Uh, and I know when I first started teaching about electricity many years ago, uh, the norm was, well, uh, the, 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 the supply curve is fairly static, but we have to focus on movements in the demand curve. Uh, and uh, uh, now we have a movements in the supply curve that are really quite different. So the, the stochastic variations in wind and solar generator need to be accounted for. They need to be understood, first of all. I know at, at MIT in a project we have that's looking at the future of storage, we have about seven years of, uh, of wind and solar data to, to try to drive our understanding of, uh, of reliability in the system. Uh, but but this, reflect, this affects having, having stochastic generation, intermittent generation at high penetration rates, it affects the uh, resource adequacy values of different types of resources. So for example, in solar dominated systems like the system in California, uh, the resource adequacy value of additional solar is often very small. Uh, there, there's just a lot of it. It may be valuable from a decarbonization perspective because it's cheap, uh, but uh, uh, there, there's so much of it uh, and it, 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 its attributes are, uh, are intermittent that it really doesn't help to meet uh, 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 the, the, the peak demand or the peak net demand on the system. Uh, as I'll show you in a moment, focusing primarily on meeting peak demand as, as we did for, for decades and decades is no longer valid when you, you have a high penetration of VRE. Uh, the the resource adequacy value and energy prices depend on production under stress, stress conditions, which may not be the same as the time of peak demand. Uh, and so the challenge is to harmonize resource adequacy and decarbonization goal, goals. I mean, there are also operating issues in, in, resource ad, in the resource adequacy assessment. Uh, in New England, uh, until very recently, for example, and in New York uh, and in PJM, capacity was capacity. Uh, if it was dispatchable, uh, there was some variation in terms of uh, ramp rates, but it, it wasn't given a whole lot of consideration. Now flexibility is much more important because of uh, rapid swings in the supply that are available. Uh, ramp rates are very important, especially in, in solar dominated systems. Uh, and increasingly uh, system operators around the world are focusing on, well, how are we gonna deal with real time operational needs when we, we, we get rid of, when we, we no longer have a system with, with the inertia provided by, uh, by spinning turbines, uh, but but are, are relying on on uh, uh, on on uh, systems that that uh, uh, don't have that kind of uh, that that kind of inertia. And then their question: What are the capacity values of these systems? So let me give you an example. This is August fourteenth, twenty twenty. It's the California ISO. It's the day they had a loss of load. Uh, there's been a lot of fuss about this. I can tell you, it, it's it was two to three hours of a thousand megawatts of lost load in a system that had a peak demand of 47,000. So it, and, and it, it lasted uh, two to three hours. So it, I mean, to me, it wasn't a, a, a terrible thing that happened, but there's been a lot of fuss about it. But what I, what I wanna show you here is the peak demand on the system is there. It's about 46,000 megawatts. It was a very hot day and uh, this was, one of the three highest days of, of demand, of, of, of gross demand uh, uh, since 2001. 
uh, when California had last had rolling blackouts. This is the uh, net demand. And the net demand is the full demand on the network minus the uh, uh, interruptible intermittent generation, the wind and solar, which can't really be controlled by the system operator aside from uh, curtailments. And that peaks over here a few hours later. And this is where the lights went out, right there. Uh, that's when the rolling blackouts were called uh, uh, right around six o'clock, 6.30. Uh, and they continued for, for two to three hours on this day. It, it actually wasn't that hard to meet the peak demand because you still had, had uh, uh, quite a bit of sun. Uh, but uh, when the sun fully went down, I'll show you a picture in a moment of the wind, there wasn't much wind. Uh, they had to rely on dispatchable generation that's still there, gas generation and imports, emergency imports from other states. Uh, and there just wasn't enough operating reserves and the system operator uh, uh, ordered uh, uh, a mandatory rolling blackouts of a thousand megawatts uh, for the entire system. I'll, I'll just point to this as well. Uh, this is the, is a, in, in the solar dominated systems, there's just a very steep ramp uh, and uh, late in the day uh, as the sun goes down. And uh, uh, one of the issues that continues to come up is especially during the transition, how much gas capacity, combined cycle, uh, peaking capacity, how flexible does it have to be to stay in the system and for how long it will be in the system. And this is of course in a zero, in a carbon free system, this is where storage is gonna come up and I'll turn to, to that in a, in a little while. So let's look at the, those, that's August 14th. August 15th also had a, uh, had a, shorter, a, a shorter rolling blackout. And there are just two things from that. This is the wind on, uh, uh, on August 15th, the, the day after the, the day on the previous page. And here's August 14th. And uh, there are two things to see. First of all, the wind during the critical periods on the two days was quite different. Uh, and it, there, these are actually for California bad wind days. Wind, wind generation can be four or 5,000 megawatts there. So that was one issue that uh, on the 15th, they had less wind. On the 14th, it looked, excuse me, on the 14th, they had less wind. On the 15th, it looked like they'd be okay. And they, they, plant, and they, they followed this, but then there was a sudden dip uh, in wind generation. And that's when they had to implement rolling blackouts. And there are arguments about this. Was there enough, were there enough operating reserves? Did they take action too quickly and so on? But here's where flexibility really comes into play. There was a sudden drop in the wind and then it recovered fairly quickly, fairly quickly as well. Uh, and that created challenges for the system operator. There are also changes in, uh, in pricing patterns uh, during the day, intraday pricing patterns uh, with much lower prices in the mi middle of the day uh, and much higher prices in California later in the day. Uh, we've, done, we've done simulations at, at MIT on looking at 100% uh, or close to 100% uh, carbon-free systems. And we get a lot of hours where prices are zero. Uh, and then a very small number of hours where prices are very, very high. And to, to, to get all the regions we're looking at to actually balance uh, supply and demand meeting reliability uh, criteria and recovering uh, all of their uh, all of their costs from the market. Uh, we've had to raise the value of loss load to fifty thousand dollars a megawatt hour to make it clear and to deal with uh, some of the uh, unusual intermittency attributes of, uh, of of wind and solar. And and this is just uh, a, 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 just a random day. A, a couple of weeks ago, I picked uh, for California, but this shows what the issues are going to be. You know, this is solar production. Obviously, it produces uh, uh, when the sun is shining. Uh, this is uh, uh, late in the fall, so the actual production is substantially less than it would be in, let's say, the end of June, when it would have been more like twelve and a half thousand. And here, are the day ahead prices—they're they're very low during the during the day, uh, and then they shoot up to here. Uh, and you know, a question that's on the mind of uh, uh, many owners of solar facilities is, well, how are we going to get paid uh, if the prices are going to zero when we're producing? 
Are we, and, and the answer is uh, you're going to have to get paid out of scarcity pricing, and it's going to happen on days when uh, when uh, wind is bad and solar is bad relative to uh, to demand. So the that picture of what an electric power system looks like has changed. Uh, in a high VRE penetration system, the dispatch curve. Uh, first of all, it's not controlled by the system operator, it's exogenous, but there can be a lot of zeros. And there can be a lot of hours when there are curtailments, and there has to be some system for managing curtailments. Then there'll be uses of storage, uh, to, uh, and the price will have to rise. Storage will buy when it's low, and they'll sell when it's high. Uh, they, they ha the price difference has to meet uh, uh, arbitrage constraints to make it economical for the, the storage to operate. And maybe there'll be a little bit of dispatchable generation left on the, left on the system. Uh, but what's different in addition to the resources is unlike the traditional, the traditional dispatch curve, which is fairly static, this moves around uh, from day to day and, uh, and or hour to hour. Uh, and in low VRE con contingencies, uh, the curve shifts back and you may have many hours when prices are very, very high. During high VRE systems, the su supply curve moves out and you're gonna have many hours when it's very, 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 very low. And, and this creates challenges uh, for figuring out how you, get, how you meet resource adequacy goals uh, when, when your, uh, your portfolio of supplies uh, is moving around all of the time as the, as the wind and the sun move around as well. So, this is led, uh, led in particular by the California Public Utilities Commission uh, to, 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 to developing more sophisticated modeling of the supply side of, of high VRE systems, uh, of the associated loss of load probabilities and duration of loss load. They're now basically calculating loss of load uh, probability distributions for, for 8,760 hours a year or, or groups of similar hours. And they're looking for resources that can supply reliably during the high loss of load probability hours. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, uh, other resources will get little credit for, for resource adequacy uh, if they're not supplying during those hours. And I said California's farthest along. PJM is doing some work on this. Uh, uh, and uh, I know work is going on uh, other places as well. But here are the latest results from California. These just came out this summer, and I think they're pretty, pretty interesting. Let's just look at we'll just look at PG&E, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric in Northern California. Uh, they've included behind the meter solar as, as supply, even though the ISO actually can't see it. But it only gets 4.3 percent of its AC rated capacity uh, as a capacity credit. Uh, Grid-based fixed PV gets a little bit more. Uh, tracking PV that follows the sun uh, gets a little bit more, but adding uh, hybrid means they've added storage. That basically gets a uh, full capacity credit. Wind is somewhere intermediate uh, uh, in both uh, uh, without, without hybrid uh, and with the wind. And, and, and the reason for these differences uh, is because of the different uh, stochastic properties of uh, of generation from the wind and solar facilities, which are really quite uh, quite different from up one another. Uh, obviously, in the case of solar, you'll, oh, the sun only shines during the day. Uh, the wind can blow uh, uh, various times of the day, depends heavily on, se on, on seasons in California, uh, and so on. And what's interesting here is over time, so these are the values that, that they, for 2020, for, uh, that they want to use for 2022. Uh, then for 2026, you can see basically the capacity value for, uh, for solar PV uh, without, without storage disappears. Uh, it's basically zero, and that's because there's, they anticipate so much solar uh, uh, entering the system uh, that they're going to be oversupplied during many daytime hours. Uh, and wind, uh, wind's capacity value declines somewhat, but not all that much. And from a reliability perspective, Wind is more valuable than, uh, than, than solar PV, uh, but PV is, uh, especially in Southern California and in the, uh, uh, west, in the Eastern Desert area, uh, is very cheap uh, and very valuable for meeting uh, uh, decarbonization constraints. 
And then by 2030, they expect basically uh, without storage, the, the resource adequacy value of PV will be nothing, zero. Uh, wind is fairly stable, uh, but it can be increased, roughly doubled uh, by adding, adding storage to the wind facilities. So how do you apply these kinds of ELCC values? And I would predict they're gonna be calculated uh, uh, more and more. Well, in those areas where you have load serving entities that have some kind of a resource adequate responsibilities, uh, these can be used to credit resources. That's how they're using it now in California. In ISOs with centralized capacity markets, they can be used to discount the value of the capacity that you, uh, you're bidding into the system. Uh, and this isn't a happy, a happy situation for the solar generators in particular. Uh, in ERCOT, with an operating reserve demand curve, it, they're already kind of doing this uh, when they do the analysis of loss of load probabilities and, uh, uh, and duration of load and how it varies with, uh, with uh, uh, different operating reserve uh, requirements. Uh, and uh, for, for the ORDC, it's going to be a question of, of more fully integrating uh, solar into that system because solar is expanding quite quickly in, uh, in, California, in uh, Texas at the moment. Uh, more broadly, I'd say deep penetration VRE systems, from my perspective, are better matched to an ORDC approach, like the one in ERCOT, uh, and uh, uh, are less well adapted to a, a system like we have in New England or New York or, uh, or PJM, taking account both of the intermittency, but also of the changing distribution of wholesale prices that are, are going to be very, very important in these systems, the energy prices, which are basically gonna provide no net revenues during many hours of the year, and most of the net revenues during very high priced hours of the year. And the ORDC approach picks that up uh, relatively nicely, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, let me now turn to storage very quickly. Uh, energy storage is obviously an important resource in, in, in high penetration VRE systems. Uh, uh, there are many potential storage technologies at various stages of technical readiness. We have a big project at MIT that involves engineers and scientists and uh, economists and statisticians looking at different storage technologies. Uh, uh, I'm not going to list them all, but uh, there are some are old technologies like uh, stored hydro and pumped hydro. Uh, batteries, lithium, bat lithium ion batteries are now favored, but, but there are a lot of other technologies out there that are, uh, are being researched as well. And, and the capital costs, the conversion losses, the energy density, the power density, the, the discharge duration vary widely across, uh, across these technologies. And uh, uh, what the future will be in terms of the optimal mix of storage technologies is, uh, is pretty uncertain at the present time. Uh, we do know that the old favorites like stored hydro and pumped hydro face environmental and public acceptance challenges in many cases. So we're looking at batteries, lithium ion batteries are the, uh, are the, the technology of choice now, but uh, this is likely to change potentially over time as these other technologies uh, are further developed. Uh, the technologies also vary in terms of their uh, the conversion efficiencies. Remember they're buying low and selling high uh, and there's a loss of, of energy as they're converted, uh, and that's going to affect wholesale prices as well. Uh, uh, so the, the, the simple, simple bump up I showed you a minute ago for storage is not going to be a single, it's a single number. It's going to depend on the mix of technologies that are there uh, and how they interact uh, with, for example, an ORDC, an ORDC curve, uh, which will reflect uh, the deterioration in uh, available operating reserves. Storage has multiple potential applications, shifting energy supply from one period when prices are low to another when prices are high, inter intertemporal price arbitrage. This is, the, this is what economists like to study the most, uh, but they can also supply capacity in systems that value capacity uh, uh, directly in the markets or through resource adequacy requirements. They can provide frequency regulation, other ancillary services, although uh, the demand for these services is naturally limited. Uh, uh, maybe it'll be higher than it is today in, in deep penetration VRE systems, but uh, in the long run, you're not gonna be able to cover your costs just uh, on, uh, on, on frequency regulation because the influx of storage is gonna crush the prices for, 
uh, for these ancillary services. Uh, they can defer transmission and distribution needs. Uh, and, but right now, at least in the US, there are very few places where uh, it's economical to install uh, lithium ion batteries, let's say the, the technology of choice, and have them cover their costs based entirely on uh, arbitrage, pro arbitrage profits uh, and ancillary services prices. That's likely to change as, uh, uh, as, as, as VRE generation, uh, the penetration increases, but at the present time, there are very few places where you can finance these alone. And as a result, uh, many of the states and the federal government have, have been subsidizing in one way or another uh, uh, investments in, uh, in storage capacity in, in, in part to, to deal with some of the issues, operational issues that they have, but also in part to, to begin to, to test out different technologies. And then going back to this day in November, a couple of weeks ago, in a, in a very deep VRE system, deep penetration VRE system, these prices are typically going to be very, very low, down closer to zero than we have here. And this ramp is going to be provided by storage primarily. And the price at, the, at a period like this compared to the price down here is going to be very important for defining how the storage gets paid and whether it gets paid enough, enough to attract investment into the system in a system that's going to rely on, uh, on energy prices for compensation rather than capacity prices or uh, long-term PPAs. So how's this going to happen? Uh, the, the biggest agenda item in the, uh, in the US now is integrating storage into wholesale markets. Uh, I don't think this is all that complicated, although some of the ISOs have made it uh, complicated. Uh, basically, storage, they're, they're net generators. Uh, they buy and they sell, but they're net generators, uh, with have which have energy generation limits based on, on, on how, much, uh, how many megawatt hours are stored and uh, uh, for how many hours you can operate them at capacity. Uh, they're, they're well suited for all of the services that uh, are purchased now in, uh, in, uh, uh, in ISOs. Uh, in areas that still have more traditional utilities, they can be used for resource adequacy calculations or in systems with capacity markets. Uh, uh, they can participate in capacity markets. As we saw, they have high capacity value because they can be a valuable available during those critical times. Uh, uh, integration to transmission planning and compensation mechanisms uh, appears to be more challenging. And, and this reflects the historical view that generation is over here, that's competitive, and transmission is over here on the right, that's based on planning and uh, either long-term contracts uh, through competitive bidding or through uh, some other kind of uh, regulatory cost recovery process. and. Uh, uh, storage doesn't seem to fit into that kind of paradigm very well. That paradigm was never really right. I mean, if you had a, a transmission constraint, if you had a load pocket, there was always two ways of uh, responding to it. One was to build more generation inside the load pocket, uh, and the other would be to build more transmission capacity to, uh, to either eliminate or reduce the load pocket. Uh, and they're have, just having some challenges in the U.S. figuring out how to fit this into uh, transmission planning and compensation rules that uh, govern the system here. Uh, and I believe they're having similar problems in, uh, in Europe at the present time as well. Okay, let's go back to August 14th. Uh, that was the day when there were rolling blackouts. Uh, this is the production of the batteries on the system. They don't have many, many batteries on the, on the bulk power system that are, are, are seen by the ISO. Uh, and these are real-time prices, which are uh, over here. Uh, this is the period when they were rolling blackouts. And what you can see here is during the morning, uh, the batteries are basically providing uh, ancillary services. They're, they're charging, they're discharging, they're going back and forth, uh, and uh, they're basically following the, the, the real-time prices. Then beginning around uh, two or three o'clock, and that was the period of time the ISO warned that there, there might be blackouts, uh, they begin to discharge, having been charged up down here, 
And then when real time prices get to the price cap, which is $1,000 a megawatt hour in California at this time, you get a lot of discharge of the batteries and they're, they're helping to, uh, to meet the peak demand. If there were more batteries on the system, uh, the, as had been planned, but they hadn't been finished yet, uh, there probably never would have been those rolling blackouts. Uh, so this is just an example of how batteries can provide ancillary services and also be there uh, to meet the peak net demand in this, in this case when the system was, was very stressed uh, and also to ramp up uh, here to, to, to help to meet the, the ramp up uh, late in the afternoon and early evening. Uh, this is just a, a chart from some work we're doing at MIT. I'm not going to go into any, uh, any details here. Uh, the one point I want to make uh, is, uh, well, I should make two. This is for Texas. These are simulations for 2050. So who knows what 2050 will look like, but we have to make some assumptions. Uh, and, and there are two things I'd like to show, because I think they're, they may be quite relevant to Australia. Uh, in, in Texas, the solar and wind resources are so good that even without any policies, uh, you get about a 70% reduction in CO2 emissions and heavy penetration of uh, wind and solar and, and, and then residual gas. But then the different uh, storage technologies, and they're listed here, thermal, metal air, hydrogen, uh, uh, flow batteries, lithium ion, uh, you, depending on which are available and what their costs are, you can get a mix of, uh, of, different, uh, of different technologies. Uh, and that has different implications for the emergence of wholesale prices. Uh, and then a, a general finding we're, we're, we're finding for the three regions of the US we're looking at is going to zero, that is 100% carbon free, is really expensive. Having a little dispatchable generation, at least on the system, uh, is really valuable. And you see this big jump up in, uh, in, in the amount of uh, uh, wind and solar that's needed to meet reliability constraints. There's a big jump up in the, uh, in the average cost of the bulk power system. And the incremental cost of uh, uh, removing the, the last few tons of uh, CO2 from the system are, are in the thousands of dollars uh, a, a ton of CO2. Uh, and I think systems are just going to have to realize that uh, going all the way to zero, given the technologies we know about here, is probably not, uh, not so good. And maybe you want to go to 95% carbon free and, and, and get some real, uh, real negative emissions in some, in some other way. And we, we really don't know which of these technologies is going to dominate the storage technologies because uh, many of these are not... Uh, are, are not close to commercial, uh, commercial uh, reality at the present time. And I'm finished. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Uh, there are a few questions in your chat box, uh, which I'm going to uh, relay. Maybe you can read them yourself uh, as well. There's one from uh, Patricia, uh, who is asking that, uh, um, the following. Um, given Australia's experience of multiple wind farm tripping for in transmission network issues, shouldn't we be looking at some joint distribution of resources and network failure uh, to yeah. think about resource adequacies? So maybe you have an answer yeah. to that. Yes, uh, obviously that's true. And uh, I think luckily in most of the uh, ISOs in New England so far, first of all, we don't have so much penetration. But they've also way over system, quite frankly, in the last uh, in the last ten years. But over the long run, we have to look both at the joint distributions of uh, of uh, production from wind and solar facilities and the constraints that may be may be imposed by the uh, by the uh, uh, transmission distribution. If we go down to the distribution level, uh, by the dis distribution level. So that's on the one hand we should consider them. On the other hand, that, that information needs to be factored into the, 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 the system for investing in transmission. Uh, and there are a variety of different approaches to this. I, I know in Australia, you, you were very focused on, uh, at least for a while, on, on what I call classic merchant transmission. Uh, but I, I think the two interact with one another. And there's a general recognition if you go to very high VRE systems that we need, we're gonna need to uh, expand the transmission system and change its configuration 
rather significantly, uh, at least in the US, the best solar resources, not surprisingly, are not in New England, they're, they're in the South. Uh, and the best wind resources are uh, in, the, uh, in the wind belt in the Midwest and offshore of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Northeast. Uh, and that's been required uh, to, to, to efficiently exploit those resources, substantial uh, investments in transmission capacity, uh, and, and at least in the U.S., a, a political economy that uh, is very different from what we, what we have now. So thank you. There's, there's more questions. I'm going to try to uh, feed, feed a couple more to you. So one from Brian, who is asking the following. Uh, levelized cost of energy analysis are popular because they're easy to understand, but they're faulted in the sense that they're not showing the different reliability issues of various technologies. So have you looked at applying ELCC or other considerations to those uh, levelized cost of energy analysis to improve as a metric? Yeah, so first of all, I am not a big fan of levelized cost analysis. Uh, I mean, it's fine if you're comparing two generators that have very similar production profiles, uh, but if you're comparing, uh, if you're comparing, you would, a nuclear plant with a wind farm with a gas plant, levelized cost is just not very meaningful to me because they they, ha they have different production values and and uh, uh, you really need to take those into account. And you know, private developers don't look at levelized costs; they do simulations of what the uh, of, of what the revenue is going to be at different times and and, and whether they they'll, they'll be able to cover their costs. So I, I'm not a fan of of levelized cost calculations and. Uh, in doing the ELCC calculations, there, there's no levelized cost. This is this is really using uh, probability distributions and uh, uh, what we know from historical data about the production profiles uh, of the stochastic production profiles of these these uh, uh, various technologies, along with the stochastic properties of demand. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, there's a slightly proactive question from somebody who chose to remain anonymous, so maybe could not uh, register properly. So the question is this, given the low prices at times of solar generation, is there a case to be made for installing solar without explicit subsidies or revenue from emissions or to any markets like green market? Well, I, you know, I think the case for solar uh, I, the case for any of these technologies, in my view, you know, turns on their their economics. What is the lowest cost way of uh, of meeting demand? But they also they also turn on their their value in, in meeting uh, decarbonization constraints. So if, if you're if you're going to zero uh, emissions, as uh, all these states in the U.S. pretend they're they're going there, and and you're in an area where uh, solar is very cheap. Uh, you may want to keep investing in solar, uh, uh, even though uh, even though uh, it uh, 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 it has no capacity value, very low capacity value. So then the question, I think your question is, well, how do you pay for it? And uh, what's happening is that uh, uh, in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, we're seeing more state mandated. Uh, auctions for long-term PPAs to support, uh, support more investments in, in renewable energy, basically saying there's some market imperfection in the, uh, in the energy and, and, and capacity markets that's not leading to adequate investments here. And you have to understand, having a reliability target and having a decarbonization target are not necessarily the same thing. They have to be harmonized. And that, to me, is the challenge, and that's what the ELCC is trying to do because it's coupled with a, uh, a, a decarb decarbonization standards that have been applied, in, it, certainly in California, to the load-serving entities, and they must meet 60% of their, 65% at least of their, uh, of their uh, renewable energy zero carbon uh, technology goals with long-term contracts, at least 10 years. So there's a growing uh, uh, a process of competitive procurement uh, under long-term contracts uh, uh, for not just for solar, but for offshore wind. Uh, all the New England states have had competitive procurements for offshore wind and 20-year contracts, competitive procurements for new offshore transmission capacity and so on. And I think increasingly that's the way this stuff is gonna get paid for. 
uh, because nobody seems to trust the uh, uh, the sensitivity of wholesale market prices to to, to yield uh, uh, net revenues that will will support investment. Thank you. So maybe in one last question, I'm conscious of time. There are a few interesting questions, but we may not be able to address them. Or a more technical question from Greg uh, Williams from the AMC, who's, uh, who's asking, are there any interactions between the ORDC and ramping services? You no, know, not direct, not directly. But when you sort of get into the, uh, the underlying uh, the underlying uh, analyses that lead to the placement and shape of the ORDC? The answer is yes. Uh, so when they look at operating reserves, uh, the analysis uh, takes into account uh, uh, ramp rates and, and flexibility. Now in the ISOs with capacity markets, they've created products that, that ramping products, flexibility products, and they have auctions. They, you know, they're they're competitively procured like uh, like ancillary services. Uh, in California, they have ex explicit uh, in their resource adequacy uh, requirements a specific product for flexible generating capacity, uh, and. Uh, uh, that is the way they've dealt with it there in New England and in PJM. Uh, they're putting products into the market where they're basically having suppliers with uh, that meet meet the performance characteristics bid in to, to supply that that capacity. All right, thank you very much, Paul. I'm just very conscious of time, um, and I understand that you have other engagements on, on your side of the Pacific as well. So I'm going to bring this to a close. Um, I'm sure uh, if they could, our participants would clap and thank you very much. So I do. Um, thanks again. And uh, we'll. Thank you uh, for having me. My pleasure, absolutely. What I suggest we'll do is that there are a few more questions that are outstanding. I'm going to take them down uh, and we'll, we'll get some answers and we'll post them on the website and direct people to it. Um, thank you very much again. Our next meeting is with. Uh, Omer Karaduman, who is going to tell us specifically about storage, that's on the 9th of December. Thank you very much all for joining us and have a great day. I was one of his thesis advisors. <laughs> I'm sorry, come again? I was one of his thesis advisors. That's yeah. right, that's right. This is in the continuation. All right. Okay, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks very much, Paul. Have a good Thanks, day. Paul. Take care. Stay Bye. safe.